In the world of Mopar drag racing, the list of influential racers is extremely long, but today we're going to talk about an unsung hero from Ringgold, Georgia, a dairy farmer named Robert Nance. And we're going to take a deep dive into his racing history, which goes all the way back to the 1950s and extends into the 1980s with the running of his final race car, a Plymouth Duster. That Mr. Plymouth name carried a lot of weight in the Southeast, and it's part of the legacy of Robert Nance. Long before that Mr. Plymouth nickname came about, Robert Nance spent his days at his family's dairy farm in Ringgold, Georgia. The first mention we have of Robert Nance's racing career comes in 1958 with this small clip from the Chattanooga Daily Times. And it's a small mention, but it's a really big deal for Robert Nance because he drove his 1958 Plymouth, a brand new car, to Daytona Beach to run on the famed measured mile course. And he came back home with the Daytona Beach Chamber of Commerce Century Club Certificate because he went 115.905 miles per hour. So moving on in his racing career, he takes what he learned on that measured mile competition and applies it to the more conventional drag racing application. And he did this with some stock bodied cars, but he also branched out into the gas class with a Henry J that had a Plymouth engine in it. He raced this car for a short while, moving on into a 32 Ford in 1961. And we see a picture of it here at that Hicks and Drag Strip up against a 40 model Ford Coupe. Moving into 1962, things really started to change for Robert Nance. He was still running the 32 Ford with the Mopar engine in the gas class, but he bought a brand new 1962 Plymouth. And this was a very special partnership with Plymouth because this was a very special car. This was one of the first of the factory drag cars. It was a 62 Plymouth with a 413 cubic inch engine, 13 and a half to one compression, and an advertised 420 horsepower. This was a revolutionary car, and Robert was able to get his hands on this thing because he was a factory Plymouth racer. I don't have any confirmed pictures of Robert Nance's 62 Plymouth Max Wedge car, but this 62 Plymouth Max Wedge car was photographed at Harriman Drag Strip. So not many of these things floating around at that point. So considering this is photographed at a nearby track, I'm using it as a very clear example of what Robert Nance's 62 Plymouth may have looked like back in the day. He took this car to Hickson Drag Strip. It only had 270 miles on it, according to this article, and he went out there and won with it. This car ran 12.45 seconds in the quarter mile, and then only two weeks later, he knocked that ET down to 1239. So this car absolutely ran away with all of the stock eliminator races in this local area. So he started going to bigger races, started branching out a little bit, going and traveling to races, and the car continued to do well. And because of this relationship with Plymouth, he had to report back every time he went to a race to tell him what the car ran, what kind of issues he may have come up with, what kind of problems the car had, and what kind of success that he had. So he would report back every week to his representative there at Plymouth and talk about what he did, what went well, what didn't, and they would make changes based on racer input. So this led to some huge opportunities moving forward with Robert Nance's career. So moving into 1963, he got a brand new 1963 Plymouth, another factory car, lightweight components, big 426 Max Wedge engine. This thing was completely as fast as you could get when it came to a factory produced car. And he had a lot of success with it as well. Meanwhile, he was still competing in the A-Gas category with a 1940 Willis Coupe. Now, he partnered up with Red Stanley on this car. Again, this was a very competitive car and it had a very high horsepower combination in it. Again, Mopar powered, of course. And this car went on to win a lot of races locally at Paradise Drag Strip, Hickson Drag Strip, all over the Southeast, this car was very competitive in the A-Gas ranks. And even in this poster, you can see that they put out a bounty on Red Stanley with that 40 Willis Coupe. So during all of this, he's got two cars running simultaneously, one in the Gas Coupe and Sedan class, and one in the Superstock ranks. Both cars are winning races on a regular basis, and he's just continuing to build upon this success by every single year getting another new factory produced car. So 1964 comes along and that's when the Hemi comes out. The very first 426 Hemi was available in those 1964 Superstock cars. 1964 is also when the Mr. Plymouth nickname came along. 
and you can see it lettered on the door of the 64 Hemi car. And you can also see designations of the aluminum fenders. You can also see a designation of Hemi on the sail panel. So this car definitely stood out compared to his previous cars. And you'll see all that nice lettering. And in the color pictures, you'll notice the light blue paint job and yellow steel wheels. That was an odd combination that definitely got a lot of attention, but it doesn't really come through on these black and white pictures. So when 1965 comes along, Robert actually keeps the two cars. He's got a 64 car and a 65 car, and he's running them both simultaneously, one in super stock and one in AFX. Here's a cool shot from 1965 at Union Hill Drag Strip in Nashville, Tennessee. And you can see in this picture, you've got two Mr. Plymouth cars. The one ahead is the number two car. That's the AFX 65 car. The one in the background is the 64 car which at this time was still running in super stock, but would later switch to different classes. But also in this picture, you've got James Lake and Robert Nance. They're standing together in that back row and you can see the Nance's logo on their shirt, that oval logo. And these guys traveled all over the Southeast together, running these companion cars and eventually running other cars together. So, you know, they were not only good racers, but they were good friends and they, put their heads together on these cars and were very successful. So early in 1965, that's when the altered wheelbase cars hit the scene at Beeline Dragway in Arizona. And that's when things just started changing across the country with the AFX class. One of Robert's biggest wins of the 1965 season came in Greenville, South Carolina. They raced at the Donaldson Air Force Base and he beat them all. He beat all the big names and he's running this car in top stock eliminator but this thing is technically an AFX car, and this is actually before they got carried away with modifications to kind of keep up with the pace of that AFX class. So no altered wheelbase, no fuel injection at this point, no wild modifications. This was a relatively stock car. He took home $1,400 for that win, plus this giant trophy that is still on display to this day with Robert Nance's grandson in a little mini museum of artifacts from Robert's career. So even though NHRA had its own AFX rules and AHRA had a little bit different set of rules, these cars changed quickly and they were running at unsanctioned tracks, they were running at match races. You know, there was a kind of an open rule book, especially in the Southeast for these altered wheelbase cars. So at this point, Robert Nance alters the wheelbase on his AFX car. He moves the rear end forward and you'll notice compared to some of the other altered wheelbase cars, he didn't actually stretch the front end. This picture was taken at Paradise Drag Strip in Calhoun, Georgia, and you can see the crowd is big and they're right there on the starting line. You can see everybody's got their foot propped up on that wooden guardrail. I mean, obviously this was dangerous. These cars were unpredictable and they were right there on top of them. And for Robert Nance, he was moving on from those super stock cars that were very strict on rules to this just wide open rule book. I mean, it was really what everybody was doing. Everybody wanted to have a piece of the pie with this match racing circuit. So he built a Plymouth Valiant, the lightest thing that Plymouth had. You'll see the injectors sticking out of the hood. It had a 426 Hemi. And this one was called Little Mr. Plymouth, obviously a much smaller car than what he had previously run. And this thing ran at tracks like Paradise Drag Strip, it ran all over the Southeast because it was a pretty competitive car. And I absolutely love this picture. This was taken in 1966 at Paradise Drag Strip in Calhoun, Georgia. And you can see in the left lane, you've got Gene Cromer and the legendary Moonlighter Willis. This was a Ford powered car. It was a gasser, but he would often run in match races and in funny car races because this thing was just so fast and he's up against Robert Nance in the Little Mr. Plymouth Valiant. This Valiant didn't stick around for very long, but they made some mid-season changes to hopefully help with the handling because this was already a short wheelbase car and they moved that rear axle forward for weight transfer, but that made the wheelbase even shorter. So they ended up stretching the front end and they used what they learned on that Valiant for their next funny car for the following year. This time, a long-nosed Barracuda. So the Barracuda had a completely fiberglass body a tube chassis underneath, 426 Hemi with fuel injection, a very similar combination to what he ran in the Long Nose Valiant the year before. This was a pretty short-lived car, even though he did run at tracks pretty far away from the Southeast, where normally Robert Nance stayed, you know, in Georgia and the Carolinas and Florida. He actually ran this car and the Long Nose Valiant up North. He went to Virginia, he went to Maryland, 
and raced against some of those guys up there. For the most part, you know, he stayed pretty local. He didn't go out west all that often. He didn't go to Indianapolis all that often either. So he stayed pretty true to his southern roots when it came to where he raced. 1968 was another big opportunity for Robert Nance because he got his hands on a BO29 Barracuda. Now these BO29 cars were factory produced drag cars. They had fiberglass body components. They had a 426 Hemi with cross ram, two fours, the whole nine yards. These cars were very competitive in the super stock ranks. And he painted his car blue, a little bit different shade than what he had been previously running with the earlier Mr. Plymouth cars. And you'll see the font has changed on the lettering. Now he's got a little more of just a block style font. And this car, even though it looks simple, this thing was very competitive. So during the 1968 season, he campaigned the Barracuda as well as the long nosed Barracuda funny car. He split driving duties with James Lake and they would run this car in super stock as well as modified production. And they even continued to run it when pro stock became a thing. After the Barracuda funny car was phased out, Robert actually brought back a 65 model car to run in super stock C automatic. So the 65 Hemi car was another potent combination and he actually painted this car red for the 1969 season, a very unusual combination for him because previously all of his cars had been blue. And this car didn't stay that way for very long, maybe just a year or so. And he went back to the blue combination on all of his cars. But this car, again, even with the red, it was still a very competitive car. And you'll see it here at Harriman Drag Strip in Harriman, Tennessee, which had a very successful year in 1969 with some really big super stock races. And he made a couple of trips up there in 69 and continued his Southeast tour just going from place to place, taking home as much money as he could. I had mentioned that the BO29 Barracuda went through a few different phases and eventually ended up running in pro stock, which was really kind of a brand new thing around 1970. And as time went on, he wanted to build a purpose-built pro stock car. So again, using his connections at Plymouth, he ordered a body in white Plymouth Duster. Now the Duster was a new car for 1970 it was based off of that familiar A-body platform. So he already kind of knew the basics as far as chassis setup and everything like that. So he was gonna build this car from scratch, starting with a body in white, meaning that it was ordered without any kind of engine or transmission. It was just basically an empty shell of a car. So he sent some of the body panels out, the fenders and doors, they were acid dipped to reduce weight. He built a 426 Hemi for it, and he went out and raced this car in the early pro stock days. So again, it wasn't necessarily like NHRA sanctioned races that he was concentrating on. It was a lot of these Southern style match races and these Southern style heads up races that he was really kind of tuning in on. So when things were getting pretty serious with this Duster Pro Stock car, he ended up selling the BO29 Barracuda to some friends there in Ringgold. The Crawford brothers ended up with this car and they repainted it and they raced it locally and ended up selling it and it moved on. And, and that car still lives on to this day. It's a modern day Hemi super stalker and really neat that that thing still exists, a legitimate BO29 car with roots in this area. But when the pro stock car sort of fizzled out around 1973, he ended up selling that car to a local racer, George Brown, who renamed it the Candyman, kept the 426 Hemi. This was still a pretty fast car for the day, but it was no longer in the pro stock ranks. Around this time, Robert bought another Duster, and this time the intentions were to run in super stock. And he was gonna build a small block. It was gonna be in one of the lower super stock classes. And as it all shook out, it ended up being a super stock K automatic. So it was a 1973 Plymouth Duster 340. So in the super stock ranks, he could run that 340 engine and be legit for 1973 specifications that put him in the K designation. And then he could actually change this car to a 74 with just a couple of body modifications and run a 360 and run in super stock J automatic. So he had kind of a configurable combination on this car where he could switch it back and forth if he wanted to, but it spent most of its time as a super stock K. So as you can see, this car has a much larger back tire on it. And these super stock cars kept the leaf springs. So they would run super stock style leaf springs instead of going with a four link and narrowed rear end. This was kind of the normal combination for the mid seventies. During this time, Robert was also running a 65 car. You can see this thing has been updated. It's got the big tires on the back. The paint jobs kind of match with each other. The lettering on the door is similar. 
So this was still kind of a, a team situation with two cars running. And by this point, James Lake had moved on and Robert hired other drivers. And one of the main drivers for this duster was Jerry Bryant. He drove this car and won a lot of races there locally in Ringgold. And by this point, the traveling had really slowed down. Robert and Jerry raced locally there at Brainerd Optimus Drag Strip and Drag City. But as far as traveling out, that didn't happen quite as often. So we fast forward quite a few years, all the way to 1984, late in the season, kind of the end of the drag racing season, Robert decides to sell his last car, the Plymouth Duster, and all of his racing equipment, all of his tools, all of his stuff to just get out of the racing world altogether. And he sold all of that stuff to Stuart Way down in the Atlanta area. And Stuart took the car and he repainted it and there was some things that needed to be addressed on the body where the fenders and the doors had been acid dipped. There was a little bit of damage there. And he ended up taking the doors off the car, replacing them with another pair of doors. And he brought that Mr. Plymouth door back to Robert and gave it to him just as a memento to his racing career, something he could hang on his shop wall or something like that. And I was lucky to see this door hanging on the wall. It's actually in his grandson's business. He has sort of a mini museum of Robert Nance stuff. He's got trophies, he's got pictures, he's got some paperwork from those early days of his Plymouth arrangement in 1962. He's got all sorts of really neat stuff in here and I was really thankful to be able to see this stuff in person. And you know that brings me to another point. I'm really thankful for Joey Crawford. Joey stepped in and told me a lot about this Plymouth Duster and about a lot of different cars that Robert Nance had run through the years. So really neat to kind of see how things had changed and still see how things had remained the same. And while we were there, Joey was delivering one of the old parachutes that Robert Nance used on the AFX car. And Joey really helped me with gathering some of these pictures and some of the information, especially on that duster, because he's involved with the modern rendition of the duster, which is now owned by Dan Began. He runs this car at Nostalgia Races and he's got it set up just like the old days. It's set up with a small block Mopar in there. It's got aluminum heads on it. It's still got leaf springs out back. It's still got those 1432s on the back. You know, this thing is set up just like it would have been back in the day. So I got to see this car run at Brainerd Drag Strip. Uh, he was running down in the sevens and Joey was actually the one driving it. So, you know, they have a pretty good package here. This car is not lightning fast. It's not breaking any records but it's doing what it always did. It's consistent. He's going out there and having fun with it. And my favorite part about it is that it still has the Mr. Plymouth legacy. So this car, even though it got painted when Stuart Way had it, it got painted yellow and black, he ended up selling this car to Jerry Bryant, which was a previous driver for Robert Nance. He sold it to Jerry in 1986, and Jerry ended up adding Mr. Plymouth to the door, even with the yellow and black paint job. So this car was carrying that Mr. Plymouth name for many, many years. And then Jerry ended up selling it to Robert Nance's son, Bobby. And Bobby had it repainted, put the blue paint job on it, just solid blue, no stripes or anything, and then put Mr. Plymouth on the doors. And then it ended up getting sold to Dan Began. So, you know, this car has been through several different owners, but I'm so glad to see that that Mr. Plymouth is still on the doors. It's still got this cool retro paint job. You know, this thing really has a good look to it. And unfortunately, Dan ended up wrecking the car. He had an issue with the engine and ended up bumping the guardrail and messed up those acid dipped fenders. He put a straight style early bumper on there instead of the big 73, 74 style bumper and kind of gave this thing a refresh. You can see it's got a little bit brighter color blue on the stripes. It's got some really nice work on this thing. It's got a great look. So to see a historical car that was once owned by a local racing legend still out there making passes, still putting a smile on people's faces, that is what it's all about. So, you know, what Dan Began is doing and what Joey Crawford are doing with this car is really great. And, you know, it really does this car justice because this thing lived a long life. It could have gotten cut up. It could have gotten scrapped. It could have gotten parted out but it didn't, it lived on and that Mr. Plymouth name lives on because of it. Because this is the only car in the world that still carries that Mr. Plymouth name. Even though some of Robert Nance's cars still exist out there, this is the only one with his name on it. So it's a really neat piece. I'm glad I got to see it up close. 
And it's always cool to see when somebody makes a special effort to pay tribute to a local racing legend. And I'm thankful to be able to put all these pieces together to make this video as a tribute to Robert Nance. He was a true Southern gentleman. He was a drag racer that influenced so many in this area and all throughout the Southeast. And his legacy lives on today through this Plymouth Duster and of course through all of these pictures and videos and information that we've been able to put together in this video. So. I hope you enjoyed this walk through Robert Nance's racing career. Thank you for watching.